Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for a December SFU CD public lecture today. But before we get started, we respectfully acknowledge that SFU Burnaby is located in unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, including the Tsleil-Waututh, Coquitlam, Squamish, and Musqueam nations. And I'm honored to be joining you from Invermere, BC, on the shared unceded home of the Squamish, the Kiskanuk, and Tanaha Nation, and the chosen homeland of the Columbia Valley Métis. I'm the current director of the SFU CD program, which I completed as a student myself back in 2011 in High River, Alberta. And we support students where they live and do what they love to build their communities, economies in a sustainable manner. And since 1989, SFU's Community Economic Development Program, or SFU-CD for short, has been a leader in bringing about social, ecological, and economic change. Researchers and practitioners refer to a set of five principles that help differentiate CD from other traditional forms of economic development. And since 1998, our 120-hour certificate program is focused on developing students' understanding and practices to support them. Jumping forward to 2023, we are currently supporting students on their learning journeys from right across Canada. And why the broad appeal for this program focused on communities? It's likely because SFUCD is the only program that offers such a diverse mix of accreditation opportunities through EDAC, CANDU, Cape Breton University, and the Canadian Credit Union Association. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Wes Regan. Wes has worked in community advocacy and capacity building as a nonprofit leader, as a municipal planner, and as a public health policymaker during the COVID-19 pandemic, where he's experienced and observed issues of trust and distrust, communication and disinformation from different vantage points. This inspired his concerns about and fascination with issues of power and trust and effective public engagement and the deliberation amidst the growth in digital information, sorry, digital disinformation and misinformation. Wes, thanks for sharing your knowledge and inspiring action from our audience today. Thank you so much, Ryan. It's uh, great to be here today. And I, I'm joining you from the same unceded traditional territories of the Hunkaminam and Squamish speaking peoples in Burnaby. I'm in my little academic office nook at home that we remade during the pandemic. It's been very useful. We decided to keep it. Uh, and as an alumni of the program, uh, it's really a, a pleasure to be here today. I'm also excited to see some people in the audience um, from different um, stages in my life. Uh, and um, I'm also a bunch of people I don't know, of course. So I'm very curious uh, about the discussion that follows this presentation. And I know you're going to, you might not think this is exactly uh, what you were expecting to hear, but I hope that it is nonetheless useful. It certainly will be interesting. We'll cover some uh, terrain less covered by academia, I think. So if I had to describe my dissertation research at UBC in the School of Community and Regional Planning as a pot pie, and once I thought of that analogy, I of course knew that I would have to, then the content we are covering today is the delicious flaky crust that contains the meat and potatoes of my dissertation research, or uh, carrots and, and peas if you're for the vegetarians here today. Uh, so it really gives it shape, and it's it's sort of the container uh, around which my the core of my problem, uh, you know, is situated. Uh, the presentation today is not going to really focus a lot on solutions. It's going to focus on problematization and and trying to make sense of uh, some of the things that we're seeing today. But I do have a presentation in Langara coming in February eighth. That's going to be a little more fulsome and talk about more of my dissertation research. There may be some more solutions-oriented focus there. So here's the agenda for today. Uh, I'm going to start with two homegrown case studies in trust, misinformation, and change. One from my hometown of Kelowna, and one from the other K-town, uh, just north Kamloops. I'm then going to talk about the infodemic, which is a concept that emerged in public health that I have um, transported into my work in planning, uh, and it is... Um, a way of explaining the sort of information overload that we see today and how it's affecting public discourse and behavior. I then want to touch on change and particularly resistance to change. And I draw here on the work of a sociologist by the name of Peter Maris, who has a really helpful concept called the conservative impulse. Then we're going to get into the really crazy stuff. I'm going to talk about conspiracism, which for me has long been a thing I've been um, bemused and bewildered and fascinated by. Uh, and 
I only recently discovered that there's actually quite a lot of academic work emerging uh, recently around conspiracism. So we're going to touch on that. And then lastly, if I haven't sufficiently made the case already, uh, I hope to punctuate why this matters. So as I mentioned, I'm going to start today by talking about, firstly, the McDougal Creek wildfire that raged through West Kelowna this last August. And of course, we would remember it was aided by ferocious winds that even jumped the lake and surprised many when uh, it, it ended up starting in uh, um, Kelowna proper, causing mass evacuations and destruction of property. And it nearly destroyed my childhood home and my old elementary school in Rose Valley, where my sister and her, uh, her husband and kids live today. Similar to the fires that struck Hawaii early in the year, an explosion of misinformation about McDougal Creek fire much of it involving conspiracy theories or conspiracist assertions, spread even quicker than the flames. And these ranged from claims that the fires were caused by directed energy weapons, space lasers that supposedly exist and have been hidden from public knowledge, or it was left, uh, left-leaning left environmental radicals, Antifa arsonists who lived among us that started the fire, or it was part of a broader government plan to depopulate the planet, and there were other more specific and localized rhetoric targeting the BC wildfire services and government, suggesting that it was being arbitrary and subjective in, in choosing which communities it was going to protect. Earlier in the year, similarly paranoid themes emerged in cities across Canada regarding a planning concept known as the 15-minute city. This idea combines long-established principles in urban planning that promote walkable, compact communities in which a mix of amenities, social infrastructure, and everyday needs are easily accessible and require less time to get to, ideally within 15 minutes, as the, as the name suggests. Beginning in Oxford, England in 2022, this concept was pointed to, the 15-minute city, as a conspiracy to confine people in their neighborhoods. So rather than make it convenient to get everything you need within 15 minutes, this was flipped on its head and instead was presented as a plot to keep you within your neighborhood and not being allowed to go more than 15 minutes. And they did this by repurposing the idea of the pandemic lockdowns under the moniker of climate lockdowns and saying that this was part of the great climate change hoax. So this narrative soon spread to Canada thanks to some uh, popular figures on social media like Jordan Peterson and others, um, Chris Skye, you might know that name where a range of everyday local government work was suddenly subjected to fierce opposition as paranoias about planning helped mobilize people who had read online blogs or Facebook comments and believed that updates to official community plans or brownfield redevelopment proposals and other just routine planning work was part of this global conspiracy to lock them in their neighborhoods. And this international backlash, backlash to the 15-minute city is actually the core case study in my dissertation research. Up the road in Kamloops, a mid-sized BC city, uh, for those not from here, uh, and this is one of my personal favorites, a flyer imitating the city's brand standards was circulated in communities claiming that its 2021 approved climate action plan was part of this 15-minute city global conspiracy, and that pretty soon the city was going to take away your truck. The city's chief administrative officer even had to devote time to publicly refute this misinformation and clarify that no, the city was not coming for your truck, nor was it going to lock you in your neighborhood. When the public is faced with a crisis, an immediate one like a wildfire or an ongoing longer term one like climate change, information and knowing who and what to trust is crucial in responding. Yet today we are awash in information to the extent that when crises occur, we are often confronted with what is called an infodemic, a term that first emerged in public health and epidemiology in response to the 2003 SARS pandemic, when blogs and social media were becoming increasingly common and misinformation about that event posed challenges to the public health response. But it has quickly become relevant more broadly. Using the Oxford Dictionary definition, an infodemic is defined as a proliferation of diverse, often unsubstantiated information relating to a crisis, controversy, or event which disseminates rapidly 
and uncontrollably through news, online, and social media, and is regarded as intensifying public speculation or anxiety. And within such infodemics, we find both misinformation and disinformation, which can often undermine the credibility of technical experts and elected leaders or confuse and disorient publics. Misinformation is false or misleading information that is shared without the deliberate intent to mislead, or I should say without any intent to mislead, frankly, meaning it is often shared because those sharing it believe it is true or plausible or that it is actually helpful, if not important. So natural cures, bracelets that protect you from certain electronic or other energies, an article questioning the integrity of our electoral process, often these are shared with good intentions and genuine conviction. Disinformation is information created with the deliberate intent to mislead and is often associated with state actors. In the case of Canada and the United States, we find that Russia, North Korea, China, and a handful of others typically sow disinformation in the hope of reaping political chaos, eroding trust in institutions, and deepening polarization among the public. It's important to note, too, that internally, political actors or other domestic agents can also sow disinformation among publics to advance their aims. And of course, the United States and its allies will sow disinformation in those states which it holds adversarial relationships with, too. One more thing worth noting is that while armies of fake social media accounts or bots will do a lot of this work, our friends, work colleagues, and family members can share disinformation, and we ourselves can share disinformation, thinking it is helpful and accurate. In fact, those state actors rely on us to. Misinformation like that which spread about the fires in Kelowna or the climate action plan in Kamloops are implicated today in exacerbating declining levels of trust in various institutions and experts we typically have turned to for guidance and answers in times of crisis and change. But trust in government and other key institutions has decreased precipitously in the United States since the 1960s. So we can't put all the blame simply on social media and misinformation. There are other structural things going on in society that it's simply you know, adding fuel to the fire. Here in Canada, trends are similar, though not as dire. And of course, public trust ebbs and flows, and it has its nuances. We trust some experts more than others, some institutions more than others. But nonetheless, across many modern democratic countries in the world, there have been growing concerns that we are in the midst of a persistent crisis of trust, particularly in these pluralistic liberal democracies. The infodemic is not helping. In the United States, there is a particularly worrying trend of declining trust in scientists and scientific evidence today, or technical experts like doctors, or what Max Weber described as rational legal authority. And he was writing in the early 20th century about the rise of bureaucracies and the modern state modernity. Uh, and in place, we have found that um, the rational legal authority uh, like Dr. Anthony Fauci, for example, skilled bureaucrat, um, has been challenged by what Weber calls charismatic authority, typified by figures like Donald Trump, who have benefited from new technologies that can enable them to broadcast their opinions to millions of people whenever they like, unburdened by the need for truthfulness and accuracy. Kafefe. Charismatic authorities have often challenged rational legal authorities in today's discourse, and they're not just politicians. We see the Alex Joneses and, 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 and the um, Joe Rogans and, and, and others who have podcasts and just all sorts of content that they uh, spread misinformation and disinformation and conspiracy theories through that might appeal to those who aren't pleased about what doc the Dr. Fauci's of the world are saying about such things as climate change or a pandemic. But... Uh, those comments and, and assertions might increase donations to a charismatic authority's election campaign or drive traffic to their YouTube channel or podcast. So as the struggle over reality is waged by different types of epistemic authorities, it has also exacerbated this crisis of trust at a time of great change and interconnected crises in which trust in institutions and qualified experts is needed as we seek to make informed decisions. Again, 
This is a particular concern in pluralistic liberal democracies like ours. Here's a quote from Marsha McNutt, president of the National Academy of Sciences in the US. Misinformation is worse than an epidemic. It spreads at the speed of light throughout the globe and can prove deadly when it reinforces misplaced personal bias against all trustworthy evidence. Part of the reason why we're seeing such a growth in this uh, misinformation and disinformation is that the social media industry itself has this growth model that requires more and more of our attention. So content that is sensational, that is controversial, that is going to cause um, um, conflict and disagreement, that turned out to be really great for going viral. And so as these different platforms have competed for interest, what has emerged is this thing we call the attention economy. All the pushes, all the reminders, all the things you're getting to keep on, keep your eyeballs glued to your iPhone or your computer screen and get that steady barrage of misinformation and disinformation. The attention economy has seen the emergence of viewer targeted content competing for eyeballs in media ecosystems that span a spectrum of political leanings from radical, leftist, progressive to centrist, far right extremist. Within this media spectrum has emerged divergent records of reality. As a November 2023 article by David French in the New York Times explores, Rene de Resta of the Stanford Internet Observatory refers to this as an explosion of bubble realities. Communities that operate with their own norms, media, trusted authorities, and frameworks of facts. This has accounted, or uh, this has amounted to an increasing number of us living in what De Resta calls bespoke realities, tailored just for us. And this chart here, if you're interested, is from an organization called Adfontis Media, and they they produce these media bias reports regularly, and they have a bipartisan, uh, you know, unbiased or at least um, transparently biased uh, panel of adjudicators who will go out and scour media and, and plot uh, along these charts here. The manufacturing of these bespoke realities has been identified in the increasing polarization of publics in America, and Canada is arguably not far behind. If we can't even agree on basic starting points for debate and discussion, then how can we be an informed electorate? How can we meaningfully debate with those whom we disagree? Journalism and a free press has long been recognized as a fundamental ingredient to an informed electorate. And as such, journalism is a highly regulated professional field. By comparison, Alex Jones and Joe Rogan, once again to pick on them, their podcasts are not. And yet the latter have become epistemic, charismatic authorities who influence the perceptions of millions of people. And while newspapers certainly framed or colored the news with a more progressive or a more conservative leaning for generations, they still came to be held to certain standards of veracity and accuracy in their claims. A fundamentally important change in how publics access news occurred when we began receiving it through social media platforms. Before this, though, there was, of course, the emergence of infotainment news-like content that was stylized, editorialized, and often sensationalized in its delivery, which traces its roots back to the early 1980s. Now, I'm old enough to remember watching the O.J. Simpson slow speed chase uh, live, and that was an inflection point uh, for infotainment and the 24-hour news cycle in 1994, I think. And then, of course, over time, there was the emergence of fake news, blogs, and websites that had the appearance of news, but not the regulatory burden of news. And eventually, as media options became more diverse and tailored, algorithms pushed content to us that had, had a higher chance of confirming our own biases and beliefs, or in one now infamous and highly unethical study involving Facebook, pushing content to us that would deliberately disgust and outrage us, put a pin in that. Um, eventually, large data sets informed the algorithms which version of reality we wanted to hear and see, even if that was misinformation. In fact, it turns out social media algorithms were better at connecting us with misinformation than they were credible information. And regulators, of course, had been trying to catch up for years. Another important feature of social media, once it had become the filter through which much of us, through which 
much of us typically received our news, is noted by Jonathan Haidt in a recent article in The Atlantic. And this one regards viral dynamics. It wasn't just that algorithms were starting to curate these bespoke realities. They were also amplifying controversy, spectacle, and sensational content. Changes to social media platforms after 2009 incentivized and rewarded affective or highly emotional performances and spectacle by users themselves, as these platforms became less about connecting with friends and family and colleagues, and more about viral dynamics of content. Just maintaining connections wasn't profitable enough for Twitter and Facebook. These platforms benefited more from flame wars between users, virtue signaling, hot takes, humiliating videos, savage takedowns, <laughs> All those things that would be shared and viewed by millions and not just dozens. And here are two quotes from hate that uh, are instructive in this regard. Social scientists have identified at least three major forces that collectively bind together successful democracies. Social capital, meaning extensive social networks with high levels of trust, strong institutions, and shared stories. Social media has weakened all three. Once social media platforms had trained users to spend more time performing and less time connecting, the stage was set for the major transformation which began in 2009, the intensification of viral dynamics. As these viral dynamic trends have intensified and become firmly entrenched, scholars have taken to describing our current situation as an epoch of post-truth politics rendering political speech today less an earnest attempt to create public policy and construct nationhood, and instead an act of performing political identities and manifesting preferred realities, or the illusion of them. This performative aspect has also been described as affective politics, whereby facts and evidence are replaced by emotional appeals and displays rooted in ideology, identity, values, in-group and out-group references, and stories that evoke emotional resonance and validation and reinforce worldviews. Things we feel should be true, things we want to be true. As Patrick Fridland describes in a 2020 article, Post-Truth Politics, Performatives and the Force is its title. If one wants to understand political discourses generally, post-truth political discourses in particular, it is crucial to see them as circulating talk that performs rather than reports. As trust in institutions continues to be undermined by misinformation and disinformation, and as publics have become more politically and epistemically polarized, scholars have raised alarm bells that the breakdown in shared epistemic foundations and the rise of post-truth affective politics is undermining democracy itself as this type of rhetoric and political culture lends itself well to authoritarians, nationalists, and hardline populists who have been gaining power in countries around the world as democracy is in retreat. Authoritarian and populist leaders who tell the public everything is going to be fine. We will defeat the enemies who have conspired to perpetuate this cruel hoax on us, the scientists, the technocrats, and other monsters under the bed the corrupt liberal elites, and we will live in the real world again, one where things make sense, where the climate and the weather were always changing to begin with through no fault of your own, where you yourself don't have to change what you drive or what you eat or where you live. It will be great again. Trust me. Which brings us to change. Thank you, Carlos. Modern societies have been defined by change as a constant race for progress and discovery, challenges and up, un, upends traditional understandings of the world and society and ways of being. And of course, there's been a lot of resistance to modernity because of the, the, the change that is involved in it. A lot of reactionary politics found up in that. But today, of course, one of the biggest changes we face is that of climate change, something that global scientific consensus says human activity is driving and something scientists are also confident is a growing factor in extreme weather events that are impacting communities with more intensity and frequency. Climate change is a particularly contentious topic for a number of reasons. Western culture in particular tends to discount the future and think short term. 
large complex concepts in which multiple futures are possible are difficult to translate into tangible, immediate feeling concerns. And it took years of communication and public discourse to firmly problematize climate change, in part because the science of climate change has been questioned by industries implicated in it whose business model is threatened by its implications. A decades-long campaign of misinformation has been waged against climate action, encouraging publics to be doubtful of its existence and those who agree it is happening to resist ambitious action to address it. But the effects of climate change are already being seen in changes to industries like tourism and insurance. As seasonal weather once depended on for ski hills in the winter and golf courses in the summer has become less reliable. Smoke blankets the Okanagan where I grew up nearly every summer now. It wasn't always like this. And as the impacts of extreme weather events grow greater in their economic costs, the financial integrity of the insurance industry is being strained. This is now starting to give us a glimpse of the poly crisis. The idea of a poly crisis is attributed to French theorist of complexity, Edgar Morin. At its core, it simply says that we shouldn't see today's problems in discrete silos, that they are often interconnected, and it is difficult, if not impossible, to find one neat and tidy cause of any of them or all of them. This, of course, invites us to find solutions that try to maximize problem solving with attention to where these crises intersect and feed into one another. But oftentimes, this takes bold action, innovative new ways of doing things, serious public investment, and selling those ambitious changes, of course, takes trust and confidence of the public and other stakeholders, and good communication to ensure buy-in, or at least that has been the conventional wisdom for generations, insofar as democracies like ours is concerned. Today, however, we see resistance to changes that are in our control, that are backed by evidence, and that we could take to protect our families, communities, and planet and address these intersecting crises. So why is there so much resistance to change of this nature? Sociologist Peter Maris described this type of resistance as the conservative impulse, with respect to the fact that aversion to change and loss is not just something that politically or socially conservative people display, all of us, have the potential to behave this way. In short, when our lives are fundamentally challenged by a potential change, our instinct is to preserve our identity and hold on to those things that helped us make sense of the world and create order and meaning in which we can place ourselves. Maris first developed this theory in observing grieving widows, and he asked why some widows were able to work through that grief and adjust their circumstances, remarry or otherwise redefine their lives and move forward, and yet others remained stuck in grief, unable to move past it. Maris identified the ability to reconstruct meaning and to establish a new order in which one's life and identity had purpose and belonged as being fundamental in this grieving process and the recovery from that shock. But over time, he also discovered that the ways in which people describe their grief and anxiety about other types of change and loss was quite similar to that of a grieving widow. In particular, the environments in which we live, our cultures and societies, our cities and neighborhoods can be the objects of change and loss which animate this conservative impulse. We resist the change because it threatens our own sense of order in the world and our own place in it. If we recall our earlier slides now on bespoke realities, epistemic polarization, and affective politics, we can see how the conservative impulse finds a friend in the infodemic. As the bias-confirming, identity-validating, bespoke reality social media content that we want is out there somewhere. Some charismatic epistemic authority has validated it, and in fact, an algorithm has, of course, been programmed to help us hold on to our convictions about the world, wrong as they may be. Whether it is climate change or pandemics explained as hoaxes or election outcomes explained as frauds, our conservative impulse will be nurtured. In this regard, one particular form of bias confirming misinformation that has grabbed attention in the last few years is conspiracism. 
I believe that the attributes of conspiracism constitute a form of Maris's conservative impulse to resist change and to create meaning or to defend meaning and order in one's life. And I hypothesize that during the COVID-19 pandemic and even afterwards in examples like the backlash to the 15-minute city and climate-related planning, that it serves this at a societal scale for a significant number of people as a feature of the ongoing infodemic. Conspiracy theories are, of course, nothing new. Foundational to today's conspiracist rhetoric are certain what I'll call canonical conspiracy theories, like those early works by authors um, like the Scottish chemist John Robison or a French Jesuit cleric by the name of Augustin Bagrowell. And as political historian Richard Hofstetter notes in his 1964 book, The Paranoid Style in American Politics, Politics, these books and essays made their way to the United States shortly after publication in the late 18th century, when Puritan preachers and other civic leaders began to worry that the nefarious societal changes which Europe was succumbing to were also at play in the domestic affairs of the young republic. As Hofstetter and others, like the late Thomas Milan Conda, have noted, it was the upending of the traditional structures of power and authority defined by the church and monarchies in the wake of the French and American revolutions and the emergence of a modern secular society that Robison and Barrowell and those who followed them were resisting. And in doing so, they pointed to conspiracy theories to explain the broad and sweeping changes happening in society, which fundamentally challenged that old order. It couldn't just be that the universe is a place filled with random events and that revolutions in thinking and social values can emerge from this chaos. No. It had to be a plot hatched by fiendish, diabolical forces working behind the scenes. For if that were the case, then perhaps these changes could be undone and the old order restored. Election denialism in the U.S. today has followed a similar line of reasoning. If the election was invalid, then Trump didn't lose. Whoever is responsible needs to be punished. And when they are, this can all be undone. Order can be restored and change resisted. But how do these people come up with these different stories and iterations and claims, and, and why do people believe them? Michael Barkun, Professor Emeritus of Political Science at Syracuse University, studied the nature of common conspiracy theory claims uh, and over time developed a helpful typology. From conspiracy theories that seek to provide alternative explanations for discrete events, so the shooting of JFK, to those which recast institutions and systems in a nefarious light, so the Catholic Church, the World Economic Forum, to those which seek to provide totalizing explanations for world history and current affairs. These he categorized into event conspiracies, systemic conspiracies, and super conspiracies. Jesse Walker, author and essayist who wrote for Reason magazine, has similarly identified five kinds of conspiracy theories in his book, The United States of Paranoia. Excuse me. Firstly, there is the enemy outside. So we're concerned with alleged outsiders plotting against a nation or a community. The enemy within sees hidden threats from within the body of a nation or community, those lurking among us who would do evil and harm. The enemy above involves elites and powerful groups of people influencing and manipulating affairs from their lofty positions. The enemy below fixates on lower classes plotting to overturn the social order, so something like a communist revolution, Antifa. And lastly, benevolent conspiracies involving positive, even angelic forces working behind the scenes to bend the arc of history towards justice and help humanity flourish or evolve. Barkun also offers a typology of knowledge claims that are often central to conspiracy theories and conspiracist rhetoric. This includes forgotten knowledge. So for example, the books that were lost when the Library of Alexandria burned, or tech, supposed technologies that were lost when the Kingdom of Atlantis sank to the bottom of the ocean. Superseded knowledge, so alchemy giving way to chemistry and physics, for example. Ignored knowledge, so folk folk knowledge, traditional healing, um, you know things that the scientific medical model 
did not see as being valid in, in the rational epistemic world of, of medical bureaucracies. Rejected knowledge. So many people claiming to be uh, abducted by UFOs and government just saying, you know, nope, period, nope. <laughs> and suppressed knowledge. Uh, so this idea that, um, that there are uh, hidden cures that wealthy elites and governments have technologies and, and cures for diseases that the public doesn't know about that they are benefiting from, or such things as directed energy weapons, space lasers. In keeping with the, the thinking of conspiracy theories, drawing on Michael Shermer, who wrote the Skeptics column in Scientific American for nearly two decades, we can also include two different aspects of cognition that have been identified in the making of many of these stigmatized knowledge claims and conspiracy narratives involving different actors and agents. And these are patternicity and agenticity. Patternicity is our ability to recognize patterns in things. Agenticity is our ability to think abstractly about unseen forces and events outside of our immediate circumstances, which may have bearing on them. As Shermer points out, Patternicity helped early humans to see the leopard hiding in the tree or connections between the passage of time and behavior of plants. Agenticity has been instrumental in helping us think abstractly about the seen and unseen worlds, what's happening between these connections that we don't see. These two cognitive abilities have been instrumental to our survival as a species and the development of complex cultural and social institutions like myth, religion, and nationhood. So these are not bad things per se, just possibly overdeveloped or overused by those with a penchant for conspiracy beliefs. Another way of putting this is it's the difference between the inclination towards intuition or rational thinking. What feels true, what we want to be true, what is identity and worldview affirming, or what rationally makes more sense, even though it might conflict with our understanding of the world or certain beliefs we hold. Eric Oliver at the University of Chicago examines this in the context of conspiracy theory belief and political polarization in America. And this is not to say that intuition and intuitive thinking aren't ways of rationalizing or reasoning. They are, but they function quite differently from what we would call instrumental rationality, as they are rooted in emotions, bodily feelings, not objective, logical thought processes, and thus can lead you to very different outcomes. They are leading Americans to very different outcomes at a large scale, as Oliver's research illustrates, and as the growing body of research on affective and post-truth politics attests. In fact, Oliver observes that intuitionists lead rationalists in the American population by a factor of two to one based on national polling and research, and mostly lean to the political right, crowding out rationalist or traditional conservatives who are having an awkward time right now in the Republican Party, or possibly even other traditional conservative parties, but intuitionists straddle the entire political spectrum. And in fact, all of us use intuition at different times and in different ways. So we can put Barkun and Walker's typologies to work and Oliver's dichotomy in helping to explain why such a spike in Asian hate crime was seen as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic aided by charismatic leaders who spread inflammatory phrases like the Wuhan flu or China virus, or why there was a sharp spike in physical abuse and threats to healthcare workers, spurred by violent rhetoric often promoted by conspiracist yoga teachers and wellness gurus or libertarian far-right commentators online. Asian people and doctors became the enemy without and the enemy within. The World Economic Forum and George Soros and Bill Gates became the enemy above. Conspiracy theories and misinformation spread by charismatic epistemic authorities affirmed people's misgivings and anxieties about either and gave them permission to act badly. Stigmatized knowledge about health and wellness and the body was turned to in order to reject the reality of the crisis and the medical advice of public health experts. And as time went on, people were subjected to a constant barrage of online content the conspiracist narratives continued to grow and evolve as dots were connected between real world events and fictitious ones, real things and imagined ones, until a strange blend of real world and fantasy world emerged in the discourses of conspiracism for those who wanted it, for those who needed it. The answers that made sense to them eventually emerged, 
and the enemies who could be punished so that order could be restored. Classic conspiracy theories were typically explanatory, offering an alternative historical construct, like those put forward by Robison and Barrowell to make sense of and to resist the French and American Revolution and the Enlightenment, which challenged the old world order that they preferred. And recent studies suggest that during times of great upheaval, calamity, and conflict, like that seen during major wars, revolutions, or pandemics, when the order and regularity of the world is challenged, conspiracy theories can still be turned to in order to explain otherwise inexplicable events, often by establishing clear in-groups and out-groups, the threat from without, the threat from within, as Walker would put it, or attributing random events and random powers or agents to what's happening. So 5G cell waves causing COVID. Karen Douglas and Yann Willem van Puygen are two psychologists who have done some really great research in this vein. However, in recent years, scholars have begun to suggest that conspiracy theory beliefs provide more than explanations for discrete events or why certain institutions and people have power and authority. Academics who study conspiracy theory beliefs particularly those in cognitive science, sociology, and psychology, have begun to observe that these beliefs have moved past strictly epistemic explanatory aims and into the realm of culture and community and ontology or worldview. So here are a few descriptions from scholars that help us contextualize conspiracism in these broader terms. Hofstetter says, the paranoid spokesman sees the fate of conspiracy in apocalyptic terms, he traffics in the birth and death of whole worlds, whole political orders, whole systems of human values. He is always manning the barricades of civilization. He constantly lives at a turning point. Like religious millennialists, he expresses the anxiety of those who are living through the last days, and he is sometimes disposed to set a date for the apocalypse. Grauman and Moscovici. Other centuries have only dabbled in conspiracy like amateurs. It is our century which has established conspiracy as a system of thought and a method of action, the figurative or imaginary core of a social representation, a cohesive intellectual and emotional mindset. Ward and Voas, in their now somewhat infamous 2011 paper, Conspirituality, say, describe conspirituality as a rapidly growing web movement expressing an ideology fueled by political disillusionment and the popularity of alternative worldviews. And conspirituality brings together what they say are the feminine aspects of new age beliefs, natural wellness, healing, bodily purity, and the masculine fixation on geopolitics and conflict. Alpers, 2012, I love this quote because it just packs so much in. A radical and generalized manifestation of distrust that is embedded in the cultural logic of modernity. So we're going all the way back again to Barrowell and Robison. This is the backlash to the Enlightenment, to the rise of Republican democratic states, and ultimately produced by processes of modernization. In particular, epistemological doubts about the validity of scientific knowledge claims, ontological insecurity about rationalized uh, social systems like the state, multinationals, and the media, and a relentless will to believe in a disenchanted world. And this is taking us back to Weber, who was writing about the rise of bureaucracies and the disenchantment of the world um, through the emergence of this rational, technical, epistemic authority. And lastly, Thomas Milan Conda, a mental framework, a belief system, a worldview that leads people to look for conspiracies, to anticipate them, to link them together into a grander overarching conspiracy. Various studies and public polling are now suggesting that far more people believe in conspiracy theories than we might have assumed, and that such beliefs are not fringe, but in fact part of a mainstream cultural attitude in the United States and Canada. What is unclear is the extent to which people have adopted conspiracism as a worldview, as opposed to the extent which they might believe one or more conspiracy theories. But this finding from a recent 22 Abacus data poll suggests that the number may be significant. As 44% of 1,500 Canadians polled in the survey claimed that big events like wars, recessions, and outcomes of elections are controlled by small groups of people working in secret against us, or that much of our lives are being controlled by plots hatched in secret places. 
So going back to Barkun, Walker, and others, this is the enemy above. These are systemic um, or super conspiracy sort of beliefs. Pause, step back. When we are confronted with an infodemic of information in the middle of a sudden and shocking event, like a wildfire or a crisis unfolding on a longer time scale, like climate change, where we are confronted with considerations about significant changes that we are told we need to make to prevent its catastrophic effects, it is perhaps understandable that our brains, which develop to find patterns in nature and create meaning as we consider causation and linkages beyond what is immediately in front of us, may default to protecting our identities from threatening information by finding patterns that psychologically de-risk the situation for us, reaffirm our position and worldview, and perhaps even make some friends along the way. We are here bringing together Maris's conservative impulse and DeResta's bespoke reality with these cognition traits, which help to stitch together the patterns and agents and stigmatized knowledge, which produce a conspiracist narrative that refutes mainstream beliefs or the official record of government or another institution or epistemic authority. It helps resist change. It helps to resist a crisis of identity provoked by change, where the loss of someone's truck and job due to environmental and economic policies to them may be as potentially catastrophic and infinitely more immediate and tangible than the climate crisis. I believe this invites empathy with those who adopt conspiracist worldviews, but that empathy does not mean we shouldn't hold them accountable or challenge them. People are allowed to believe what they believe. Freedom of belief is of course a cornerstone of a liberal pluralistic democracy. And while I counsel us to feel empathy, I believe we should also be concerned about people expressing conspiracy theories and, misinf and <clears throat> misinformation online. Why? Because conspiracism and related forms of misinformation that accompany it confuses and disorients people. And this is particularly concerning in the middle of a crisis or disaster in which people's safety and well-being depends on reliable information in the short term or the long term. I remember being on my phone with my sister as she was scrambling to get out of Kelowna with my niece and nephew in the truck, ash and embers coming down the highway. And she was almost in tears as I was trying to get her the information she needed because she couldn't be looking on her phone. To wade through a bunch of conspiracist disinformation to try and get to the actual stuff is not helping in that sort of situation. It induces additional anxiety and polarization in publics at a time when we need to think clearly about decisions in chaotic and stressful conditions, and in which we need to rely on our neighbors, first responders, and even total strangers to get through it together. And of course, it undermines trust in governments and experts whom we have typically relied on for guidance and accurate information in times of crisis or in considering who to entrust leadership to in facing crises and challenges and navigating us through change. And just lastly, as far as this short list is concerned, it has been shown to harm the morale of frontline workers, which we saw with wildfire services workers this past summer, and which we saw during the pandemic. The abuse and harassment of healthcare workers and public health leaders faced during the pandemic, and the circulating of conspiracy theories and misinformation that undermined their work and vilified them has been a major factor in an exodus of public health workers in the United States, and to a lesser degree here in Canada too. These are public sector workers who we rely on to save lives and protect communities, who in both situations were pulling 16 hour shifts running ragged off their feet, and they deserve better. So summary, a lot of change happening today, some of which we have control over, some not so much, resistance either way. Change can confront us with an identity crisis, which is fundamental to why some people will resist it. It is natural though for us to resist change, to protect our sense of order in which our identity is constructed. The infodemic has brought us bespoke realities delivered to us by algorithms and validated by charismatic epistemic authorities and punctuated by affective performances by our own peers. Conspiracism is a mental framework that acts similarly to Maris's conservative impulse. It helps construct stories using patterns and unseen forces to resist change and to maintain a preferred reality. 
How many of us live in this identity protective world of conspiracism is unclear, but recent polling suggests it may be significant, may be significant even in Canada. The institutions of democracy are under strain from this epistemic polarization and the forms of behavior it engenders. As stigmatized knowledge and extreme ideas about the state and the individual spread through the infodemic, and as publics lose the ability to disagree constructively about issues in the post-truth era. And lastly, this needs to be addressed if we are to successfully face changes together in the years to come as a democratic country, something we should not take for granted. Thank you, and that's that. <laughs> Thanks so much, Wes, for your wonderful presentation and the, thanks everyone for all the questions and comments. This is just scratching the surface that there's so much more to talk about, potentially a part two on uh, some more solutions focused. But uh, yes, we have gone uh, considerably over time and we want to respect everyone's time and it also uh, let you know that you can come back to this back uh, probably in early next week. We'll have this both on our website and also in YouTube. So all of our previous public lectures are available on YouTube. Now this will be the 23rd that we've done in the past two years. So it, it's quite a volume of knowledge. And finally, if you'd like to share your story as someone that's been connected to a program in our, in our 30 odd years uh, history, whether you're an alumni, a guest speaker, instructor at one point or another, we want to hear how the program has impacted and affected you and your community and your organizations. Were you part of a cohort in Vancouver or Nelson? Did you learn on your own with a group of colleagues? And what changes have you seen in yourself, your organization, and your community since? So reach out to me afterward and stay tuned in your inbox for an opportunity to participate in a retrospective video project. And with that, I want you to all enjoy uh, a good afternoon and um, keep thinking about this and keep talking about this. And that's the only way we're going to get through it. So thank you.